Thank you very much for coming uh, to listen to this. And uh, uh, this is joint work with John Moore and Shen Xin Zhan uh, of LSE. And, and the question we want to ask is the, usually the entrepreneur raise external funding uh, against the value of the farm, either against uh, debt, using the debt, or equity instrument. And the, when you think about the, uh, the funding horizons, uh, the, the recent paper by Lian and Ma uh, said the, uh, like a, the company the typically borrow against the future cash flow or uh, assets, like a fixed asset. But the uh, cash flow based borrowing is more uh, common uh, than the asset-based borrowing. And uh, uh, the amount they can borrow typically using the debt covenant, uh, and uh, Lian and Ma found the amount they can borrow is typically three to four and five years worth of gross profit. Sometimes they call it EBITDA. EBITDA is earning before interest tax and uh, depreciation and amortizations. And uh, this is a major, typical major accounting measure of gross profit. And uh, when you think about three to four and a half years, this data is about the big companies, not the small one. So it looks rather short to us. Like uh, the company, <laughs> it's established company, usually last for uh, longer than three and four and a half years. And, uh, but why they cannot borrow? Uh, only this much, and uh, more than this much. And also, when you think about the stock uh, equity financing, uh, typically the stock analyst provides the uh, forecast of next five years, not longer than that. And uh, you might say, because of after five years, nobody knows what's going to happen. But uh, when you think about the, like, uh, stocks finance, equity finance, or bond finance, the lender can hold the mutual funds. You don't need to own the one company. <laughs> you actually uh, lend to the bunch of them. And uh, so lots of uncertainty is typically idiosyncratic uncertainty. And you can pull the idiosyncratic uncertainty uh, by having the mutual funds of bonds and stocks. So, so the question we want to ask is why horizon of this external funding, either debt financing or equity financing, looks short relative to the duration of business? And how this uh, horizon, uh, ex funding horizon, interact with the aggregate conditions? That's the question we want to ask. And uh, does this clear? <laughs> Okay, and uh, before writing down the formal model, let's have a little example to warm up and uh, also get the kind of guts feeling. And uh, this is the simple example. So suppose the people who have investment technology, we call it engineer or entrepreneur, and uh, they can invest uh, using the goods and building. Building is an asset, and the goods is uh, uh, other uh, materials, and then produce, construct the plant. And, uh, and also, when you build a plant, they acquire uh, the capacity to maintain this plant. And uh, so this, you can think of maintenance capacity as a human capital uh, to maintain and uh, maybe improve the plant. And uh, this is the constant return to scale technology. And you can doubling up the size too. And uh, so, so to finance this investment, partly use the net worth on assets, but partly use the external funding. And uh, as an uh, uh, example of external funding, we are thinking about equity financing. So they sell the ownership of the plant. And uh, so borrow, or you can say borrow 100% against the value of the plant. And uh, what you cannot sell is the human capital, maintenance capacity. So you cannot uh, say to the creditor, I will maintain this plant forever. And uh, so that's, you cannot sell. So human capital, you cannot sell. 
but <laughs> uh, physical plant, you can sell the ownership to raise the funds. And uh, tricky bits is the with continual maintenance, output will come out, yt plus 1, yt plus 2, and so on. So if engineer continue to maintain this plant using the maintenance capacity, human capital, the output will come out. Uh, but if you miss the maintenance for one period, it's gone. So it's a bit like a research. <laughs> if, <laughs> if you stop doing the research, it's gone. <laughs> and sometimes forever. So, <laughs> so you have to maintain your human capital and uh, your plant or the project. And uh, so, so that's the technology. And the, the key friction is the engineer uh, who invested cannot pre-commit to maintain so uh, every period. So the, the, the plant owner who got the plant wants to keep the things going. But the, the engineer who has a technology uh, capacity to maintain uh, cannot pre-commit to maintain. In fact, actually, the, every period, engineer can go to the other company to work for it. Or a uh, plant owner <laughs> can hire other engineer to maintain. So this is the situation, not the bilateral, like a uh, uh, fixed uh, matching. Actually, the, it's a bit like uh, the high-tech companies uh, hiring a group of software engineer to do the maintenance. And the software engineer can move around across the different companies. So that's the situation. But the, within this period, the, there is an owner and the, uh, engineer. And over time, they can change. <laughs> but uh, this period, they are kind of locked in. So, so then what you do, they may be uh, deciding how to pay for this uh, maintenance uh, service. And uh, we consider the simple bargaining. So the bargaining, the key is a surplus. And uh, what is a surplus for the workers, uh, for engineers? Engineers, they can move to the other company for next period. For the, therefore, the, the uh, surplus is actually today's uh, wage or the payment. Ne because of next period, you can go, if the bargaining breaks down, you can go to the next company next period. So the stake for the engineer is just today's wage, while the, uh, the plant owners, actually the stake is uh, the plant itself. <laughs> because of if you don't maintain, it will collapse, that become valueless. So the value is the VT plus one, the va continuation value, uh, next discounted value. So this is the continuation value at the end of this period, period T. And then you pay the W. The gap is the surplus for the, uh, the plant owner. So when you bargain this with respect to the, the payment wage to the engineer, you can see the first order conditions. Uh, do I have a job? Ah, I shouldn't. I said I don't use, but I. <laughs> sorry. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. It's there. So if you do the first order conditions, you get the, this kind of things. Minus W plus. This is the, uh, when you take a derivative with respect to WT, this is a minus, and then this is the. Uh, next one. So, so it's a Cobb Douglas. So, first order condition looks like like this, and that means the W is the one minus theta fraction of continuation value, and the uh, uh, plant owner, after paying the W to the engineer, they retain the theta fraction of continuation value. So, so you can see the owner don't get the entire <laughs> continuation value. And every period, engineer said, without me, it doesn't go. Uh, it will collapse to zero. And I want the one minus theta fraction of continuation value, which means the owner gets only theta fraction. 
And that means that when you look at the date t value, today's output is coming out already. But the next period, only theta fraction is the owners. And then two periods later, theta square fraction <laughs> is on us. And then you can see the theta is less than one. And every period, engineer keep coming back. I want more. <laughs> and uh, so, so as a result, the, it looks like uh, the value to the owner is near term because of theta is less than one. Say theta is 0.8 or something. It quickly becomes <laughs> zero in the five years, six years time. So, so that's why uh, the, the owner don't get the, uh, to raise the value mostly uh, against the near term revenue. And that means that when engineer try to finance investment uh, to sell the ownership to the shareholder, they raise only against the near term revenue. So funding horizon is short because of that. So th that's the intuition uh, we have. And uh, one question you might say is, where theta come from? Is that the bargaining power? Or where is the bargaining power? How bargaining power is determined? And how this interact with aggregate condition, general equilibrium interaction? For that, you need a better model than just a little example like this. Do you have any questions? Uh, yeah. Is it possible to capture time varying bargaining power of uh, engineers and? Uh, yeah, it can. It can. But uh, I will come back to. So it, because of this, doesn't have any theory about what determines data, and therefore I, we need a model to explain what determines data, and whether data changes over time or not. Uh, I will discuss about it. Yeah. So, uh, you had a different market structure other than yeah. reporting. You had like search and match. Yeah. Uh, did you have the same result? For uh, we didn't try the search and matching. This is more like a bilat. So ex ante is competitive. Ex post, uh, it's like a bilateral bargaining. But the key here is the next period, the, they can move to the other company. So usual search and matching. The engineer's stake is uh, also the part of the continuation value. <laughs> and, uh, so it's not just today's wage. The reason here the engineer's stake is wage is the, because of the, they can go to the other company. So, so that's different from the usual search and matching, like a labor market, uh, labor search model. Yeah. Your assumption was like if the company doesn't get uh, matched, uh -huh. uh, or like the so so collapses, they die. Mm -hmm. yeah so we are going to have a uh, in the model formal model we are going to have a competitive market for the uh, the engineering service that that will solve the, your questions if you don't see the engineer what happens and uh, here we always see <laughs> and uh, this is just an uh, introductory example so uh, in order to answer your question, uh, more you need it. And also, yeah, that's, that's OK. Shall we go on to the real? Yeah. In, in, the, in the tech sector, you see a lot of this non-compete clause, mm -hmm. which yeah. makes it difficult for the Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the non-competing clause has a lot of holes. And uh, you can move to the, you can wiggle around the, so typically the. Uh, Empirically, if we look at two companies and one uses non-compete clauses or mm. not, Mm -hmm. the, the discounting will be different. The fee yeah, different. yeah, it might be different. But the, the new company can pay for the compensation for two years or one year grace period. You can do that sort of things. So the competitive economy is amazingly adjust adjustable. So OK, let's write down the model, uh, full model. So we are thinking about small open economy because of the, we want to think about uh, impact of interest rate. So impact of interest rate could be a monetary policy, but uh, we don't want to go into the detail of nominal aspects of the economy. So, so we just say it's a small open economy. And then there is a homogeneous perishable goods and uh, which can be used for investment purpose or consumption purpose. And uh, 
uh, everybody has a utility, like a log utility. This is the discrete time, but uh, it's similar to uh, what you learned in the last two days. And uh, uh, engineer sometimes, uh, uh, agent has sometimes has an investment opportunity. These, these people, we call it them uh, engineer. And the people who don't have an investment opportunity, we call them saver. So basically, the people who have technology, investment technology, is the, uh, the engineer. And uh, they switch over time. And uh, without this turnover, actually, you can save out from financing constraint relatively easily. So we do have a Markov switching between the status of having investment opportunity or not. And uh, at each date, uh, each uh, engineer, engineer I, E, <laughs> uh, can jointly produce the plant and tools from the building and the goods. X unit of goods, X unit of goods and the one unit of building, you can produce uh, uh, one unit of pl plant. And the initial productivity we normalize to be one. And then we also get the tool. So tool is the human capital, basically acquired through the learning by doing, uh, associated with investment. And uh, actually, the typical learning by doing is learning by producing. Uh, but uh, we are putting the learning by doing uh, to learning by doing by gross investment. If you look at the uh, Arrow's uh, 1962 paper, the first paper of learning by doing. Actually, Arrow put it in gross investment, not the production, actually. So we used uh, Arrow's technology. Basically, by investing, you learn how to pro uh, get the plant as well as how to maintain. And uh, in order to finance, the, actually, you can sell the ownership of plant, but uh, you cannot sell the human capital acquired through the learning by doing. This is the tradition of what more like a human capital is not the, you cannot sell or you cannot commit to enslave yourself. And uh, so, so the, what happened is the, uh, we are going to look at the extreme case of match, matching is the free. So even within the period, you can change the match. So we have a competitive market for maintenance and uh, therefore, uh, you can hire any engineer, <laughs> or engineer can work for any plant, and uh, there is a competitive market, and uh, the wages determined uh, at the competitive market for maintenance service. And the key friction is engineer cannot pre-commit to work less than competitive wage. So <laughs> in the beginning of investment, engineer said to the uh, plant owner, sell the plant on uh, the plant, I will maintain for you and uh, uh, for free, extreme case. <laughs> but the uh, uh, plant owner don't believe it because of the next period, they can start working for some other company. So, so you cannot pre-commit to provide the service at less than market, uh, market price. This is uh, literature sometimes called uh, non-exclusivity constraint. Uh, so that's the uh, restriction we use. And the, in fact, that's the only restriction, uh, the friction we are going to consider, uh, which generate financing constraint and all this stuff. And, uh, okay. and then at each date, owner of the plant, say productivity Z, Z could be one at the beginning, and then can hire any number of uh, tools uh, or human capital who owns the, uh, this uh, engineers and, uh, and then produce and maintain the plant. And uh, this is the key technology. Basically, if the productivity starts with Z and then you hire H uh, tool per, per uh, plant, then output is proportional to this productivity. A is the aggregate productivity, Z is the idiosyncratic uh, plant specific productivity. And then next period, what is the productivity? 
it depends upon today's productivity as well as the, how much maintenance you do. If H is zero, <laughs> you can see it's zero. And if, uh, so this is the, eta is the importance of the, uh, the engineer's input for maintenance. And the theta is the importance of previous productivity. If theta is one, then you, <laughs> you can do a lot of things. But uh, uh, here the, we are going to think theta is less than one. And the eta, theta plus eta could be one, add the, adding to one. This is we call constant return to scale case. But uh, it could be less than one. Uh, and uh, we are going to assume the plant is going to shrink by factor lambda. So, so the one minus lambda fraction of plant collapse, and the lambda survives. And then also two will depreciate at the same rate lambda. And uh, the way we did it is the, you see the beginning of investment. You get the one plant with productivity one and the two one. And that means the, uh, when you put the one and one, you get the one. So, so which means the, at the beginning of investment, you produce the plant as well as the maintenance capacity, which is exactly enough to maintain the productivity at the initial level one. So that's the normalization we are, going, we are using. So ratio of the uh, plant productivity and the age is continue to be one if we have this technology. Yeah. Good question. Um, the engineer's maintenance capacity is not in any way linked to the plant. So it's not if you leave, you lose something. No, 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 no. It's, uh, it's there is a match is uh, uh, basically the free match not specific. Okay. Therefore, you can move to the other engine. <laughs> so software engineer is typically like that. So <laughs> you can move to the other companies, and they do the same, same similar things. And uh, the lots of engineers are out there for each plant. Okay. And uh, this production technology, we got the uh, idea from the Austrian, the Ben Babelk, <laughs> actually, the, the Austrian guy, who, who used the, cap what's the definition of capital? He claimed the capital is uh, like an old, old labor. <laughs> so it embodied into the old maintenance, is embodied into the, your productivity. Similar to your research tool again. <laughs> so a lot of technology actually come from inspiration from our own technology like that. So okay. So and the, where the building come from? We are going to use the simply building is supplied by foreigners. This is the simplification. Basically, the, uh, the foreigner has a technology use the building to get the output f per unit. And the building depreciate by factor lambda. So, and uh, this F is constant. This is uh, like an uh, alternative use of building, opportunity cost of using building. And you can say this is a fixed cost of using the building. But uh, actually, the, uh, in uh, my old paper with uh, John Moore, credit cycle, actually the F is alternative used by other group of people, and that was a decreasing return to scale. Therefore, that F changes with the business cycle. But here, we decided F is constant. <laughs> so, and the supply of building uh, is done by the foreigners. And, the, and basically, the, as a result, the building supply is elastic. So this is the building price and uh, in a steady state. So you can see the present value of alternative use is a building value, building price. And OK, so what the plant owner does is the plant owner is going to uh, choose whether to continue the plant. And uh, if you don't continue, you can liquidate the, the plant into plain vanilla building at the price Q. So Q is the liquidation value of the plant. And uh, today you get the A times Z output. But uh, after production is finished in the morning, midday, they can choose whether to uh, liquidate or continue. If you continue, you want to hire engineer 
to maintain. Otherwise, the, the productivity becomes zero. So how much engineer you hire, age, depend upon the wage rate as well as the return. So this is the continuation value. The wage to the engineer uh, minus plus the continuation value. Continuation value depends upon tomorrow's productivity, which is the today's productivity as a function of today's productivity and the maintenance effort. And uh, so, so that, uh, that's the owner's problem. And uh, here we call wage, but uh, wage is actually more like a key worker's payment. It's not the wage of the regular worker for production. That is more like a subtracted in A, so included in A. And uh, this is more like a key worker try to improve or maintain the productivity. And the payment to them is the way we call wage for the key workers or engineer. And then when you look at this, uh, we don't introduce the pro uh, uncertainty here. But the, we mostly work on the uh, perfect foresight. But uh, you can see here the whether plant owner continue to improve or maintain, or actually stop in finite time, affect the maintenance. And uh, if the plant owner think, OK, I'm not going to continue this for a long time. We will finish in five years, then they stop, start decaying the productivity because of they don't maintain. Especially at the end, they don't maintain at all. So, so last period, so it's just A times C. So, so you can see the, uh, the long-run perspective does affect the, uh, the maintenance uh, cap, uh, policy. And uh, how much they can raise the funds? The initial productivity is one. So when they uh, invest, they sell the ownership of plant, which the productivity is one in the next period. So, so that's the amount the and engineer can raise fund uh, against the plant. So do you see this? So, OK. And uh, what is the budget constraint of entrepreneur or engineer? And uh, this is the budget constraint. You have an expenditure side. You have a consumption. And also, you have an investment. But the investment costs the uh, goods cost x, as well as the, uh, the uh, plan, the building cost q. But against the investment, you can raise fund b by setting the uh, ownership of the plant. So only the gap you need to finance. That's the down payment for investment. And the uh, other way of using the, uh, the uh, fund is the acquiring financial assets. Could be the ownership of the plant. So uh, the engineer doesn't have to sell entire ownership. They can retain some fraction of ownership of the plant. Or they can get the foreign bond, which interest rate is R. So that's the small open economy interest rate is R. And then what is the inflow? Partly the uh, engineer's wage, income, and also uh, the financial assets, plant ownership, or the foreign bond. And uh, here we assume you can sell everything, <laughs> the B. Therefore, when you invest, you don't uh, own the, uh, the plant as a uh, as a benchmark. So the ownership of the plant is included in D. So that's why the uh, right, right hand side is uh, the payment as a uh, income, as a wage income, as well as the financial assets, D. And uh, when you have an investment opportunity, the, this, the, you keep the uh, human capital. If you invest, you increase the capacity to maintain up to HT plus 1. So that's the investment. And uh, again, the investment in the uh, financial assets or plant ownership is included in D. And uh, so that's the, uh, the
the budget constraint. And then when you write down this budget constraint in gross term, you can see the, uh, the, this H is to have a dividend as well as capitalized value. So in order to uh, acquire the new investment, it costs X plus Q minus P. So that's the down payment. So this is the, uh, the capitalized value of the human capital. And then this is the financial asset. This is the total return of human capital. And uh, that's, you can say, is the net worth. And then net worth is divided into the consumption and the acquisition of the human capital and acquisition of financial capital. So that's the budget constraint. And uh, for detail, please look at the, our paper, but uh, you can see the intuition. So at this point, you don't need to uh, follow every equation. What you need is the, what's the intuition? <laughs> and the net worth is divided into the consumption and the acquisition of the assets. Part of the asset is the human capital. Part of the asset is the financial assets, including the ownership of the plan. OK, so what's the answer? <laughs> and when uh, the rate of return on investment, so remember, engineer has an investment opportunity to acquire a plant as well as acquire the human capital. And uh, this is the rate of return on investment if you sell the entire ownership of the plant. So X plus Q is investment cost. B is <laughs> the external fund raised by selling the ownership of plant. What's left is the human capital. So next period, W you get return. And, uh, and the resale value or re replacement cost is uh, lambda still there. Yeah. So if the engineer can um, mm -hmm. attain some amount of ownership? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it doesn't change. So, 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 so <laughs> why, why is it not feasible that you could come up with some incentive compatible contract mm -hmm. where they would be able to commit? To uh, yeah. The reason is the engineer wants to uh, raise as much fund as possible. And for that, setting the entire ownership of the plant is the best, best one. Okay. So, so the, the constraint here is basically if you sell entire 100% ownership of the plant, only retain the human capital, that return is exceeding the return on financial assets or okay. uh, getting the human capital. And uh, the incentive constraint is blocked because of the, uh, this, uh, no, uh, this one. Engineer cannot pre-commit to work less than competitive wage because of they can move around. And uh, this is the contract uh, literature called uh, no exclusivity constraint. And uh, the people cannot see the, what the engineer is doing behind the back. So engineer can, software engineer can work for somebody else. <laughs> and uh, you, you cannot detect that. So, so this the engineer's uh, uh, trading history or working history is private information is the key to get this one. So do you see anything? That's a very good question. So. OK, so let's look at the, so if engineers uh, return on investing and the selling entire ownership is better than the interest rate, then they're going to invest <laughs> and, uh, as much as possible. And the uh, engineer only consume one minus beta fraction. This is the log utilities trick. And then beta fraction they save and then uh, save in human capital. <laughs> and uh, what is the human capital? Uh, acquisition cost, this the uh, goods cost, building cost, minus the uh, fund you can raise by selling ownership. And uh, that's how they maximize the human capital accumulations. And uh, if you uh, don't have uh, this investment opportunity, you just save <laughs> in financial assets. And uh, you might say, Use, if you move from engineer to, so used to be engineer, but, uh, and that, this is a little detail, but uh, if you are engineer, but today you lose, you become 
uh, no engineer, don't have investment opportunity, what do you do about the tools? And uh, we assume uh, the tool you can sell to some youngsters and uh, also sell uh, tools as well as how to you teach how to use it. So, so it's a bit like a retiring professor teaches. <laughs> and here is a tool, and then how to use it, and then the student pay for the replacement cost. So, so that's the the little detail. Uh, it's not the human capital is uh, is uh, actually the uh, wasted. Okay, and the steady state is there are two price wage and uh, plant price. And then quantity is consumption and uh, financial assets, human capital, how, how much to hire for the plant owner, and the productivity and output. For the engineer, how much to consume and uh, uh, accumulate human capital and investment. And the foreigner is just holding the uh, financial assets as long as return is competitive. Ah. OK. so. What's the answer? <laughs> this is the model. So, do you have any guess of the answer? Like, uh, so the this kind of model, you want to have a sort of guess and verify. What we did is uh, okay. If the alternative use fixed cost of uh, using the uh, building is low enough, then the plant never shut down. So, so this is a guess. So, so the, we are going to look at the uh, situation like a pure equilibrium with no stopping. Basically, the, if the fixed cost or alternative use is not that great, uh, then every plant it started should maintain uh, without stopping. So then, actually, the no plant owner stops, and the aggregate ratio of tool to plant stays one to one. This is the our assumption, actually. Basically, the production technology generates plant and tools one to one, and the depreciation rate is one to one, <laughs> and also the same, same lambda. And uh, if you start with one, you put the one, you get the one. So, so the ratio of plant and uh, tool is one to one, then productivity is going to stay at the initial level. So that's the, uh, and uh, all plant will generate A. And uh, when you think about the special case, which the uh, production technology has a theta and the one minus theta, and it turns out to be the competitive equilibrium we describe here is the same as the initial introduction uh, example, like a bilateral bargaining model which is similar to the like uh, Hossius conditions, basically. So if it's constant return, the maintenance technology, and, uh, and then bargaining power is exactly the same as coefficient of Cobb Douglas, then uh, it is the same as bargaining model. And uh, you said it might change over time. <laughs> Turns out to be if we have a same coefficient, Theta, uh, the Cobb Douglas coefficient, the share doesn't change actually. And, uh, and uh, what is the wage rate look like? Wage rate in competitive equilibrium is the same as the present value of contributions. And the present value of contribution is not just uh, maintaining. Yes. Look at the, uh, this maintenance technology. If H is going up by one, then output next period is going up by factor eta. So elasticity eta. And the h and the, uh, z is all one. So that's the marginal product of maintenance. Uh, but the next period, zt plus 1 is higher. And when z, zt plus 1 is higher uh, by eta factor, then uh, the Two periods later, output is higher, eta times theta. See? <laughs> and then three periods later, zt plus 2 is higher. Therefore, zt plus 3 is higher by factor theta, uh, eta, theta square, and so on. And uh, this is the marginal present value of marginal product of the today's uh, maintenance. So today's maintenance is not just tomorrow's output. 
it actually affects the entire future. You see, the, when you work hard today, <laughs> not only you can produce more in the next period, but also the day after and so on. So it has a long run consequence. At the same time, if you stop, it stops, phew, like a collapse. So, so this is the nature of the beast, of uh, this uh, uh, technology. And, uh, that, and uh, when you look at the, uh, the, fun, the profit for the, uh, the plant owner, the output minus wage every period, because of H is one in a pure non-stopping equilibrium. But uh, when you look at this, it looks like a constant, right? <laughs> but uh, because of wage is uh, forward-looking, Actually, the, the part of the tomorrow's output is actually, the tomorrow's output is all in uh, owners. But the day after tomorrow, eta fraction goes to the weights. Uh, and the two periods later, uh, you have an eta theta, as well as the day tomorrow's wage. So actually, the, if you look at the share of the output, future output, uh, belong to the engineer, it actually starts with zero, eight, eight, this one, and uh, it starts growing. <laughs> and uh, when you look at the owner's point of view, actually it declines. So when you think about the owner, so this is the output A, and uh, but the, the owner's share is declining over with the horizon. This is the horizon. And uh, basically, owner's strength is that they own the today's productivity. But the next period, you need the engineer. Next period, you need the engineer. Every period, your contribution gets smaller and smaller uh, from today's point of view. And in the long run, actually, the most of the productivity is a consequence of cumulative effort of the engineer. Therefore. <laughs> Uh, owner doesn't get much for the future returns. And the uh, owner's share is this, means the owner is deriving uh, most of the uh, value from near-term revenue, not the distant revenue, because of the distant revenue is a consequence of the cumulative effort of engineer, not yours. And uh, so that's why the funding horizon is short. And uh, But my, maybe you might say, why don't you stop? <laughs> like, uh, so, so the owner's share is getting smaller. At some point, it will cross the alternative use, right? So, so the, why don't you stop here? So, so then you can liquidate and get there. Uh, the answer is actually the past wage is a sunk cost. So, so when date T prime comes, Actually, the part of the wage payment is uh, part of the future return goes to the today's wage, but uh, but that part you already paid at the day t prime. So day t prime, the horizon is exactly the same in uh, pure non-stopping equilibrium, and the old wage. This is the old wage actually, the wage which is paid between t and t prime. Even if it corresponds to partly to the future contributions, it's already paid. Therefore, you don't have any incentive to stop there. And uh, as long as the return is higher than alternative use. And uh, so, so this is the, despite of uh, horizon is short, they don't want to stop it. Okay. And uh, you might say, where is the evidence? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are not uh, empirical economists, uh, but uh, this is the ULM uh, gave us the, and uh, the basically ULM and uh, uh, Lee and the, uh, the the what they said is this is ULM's picture actually. So knowledge capital share is the uh, knowledge capital is defined as the cumulative. Uh, capitalized value of R&D investment. This is the uh, Peterson Taylor's uh, the construction, and the some of the company has a higher uh, share of knowledge capital. It's like a, as high as like a forty 
3% or so. And uh, some group has a low uh, the, the, the share. And uh, I, I said to the, uh, the ULN, how come it can be negative? And uh, he said, come on, get serious. <laughs> we are doing the panel data regression. And you do the control of the bunch of stuff. So you, some, after control, some of them become negative. So, so uh, size is controlled. So, so if you control the size, it can go to negative. So this is the 20 scattered pin. And uh, you can see the, uh, some of the company has a big uh, R&D share, the capital share. Some of them don't. And uh, uh, the company which doesn't have a too much R&D investment is uh, the borrowing capacity is big, maximum debt to EBITDA ratio is like a 4 or 4.5. So they are much higher. And the more uh, the R&D intensive cap the companies, uh, the borrowing capacity is low. It's like a little over 3%, 3.2 or 3. So you can see the relationship between technology and borrowing capacity, fundraising capacity for the engineer. Yeah. Uh, not, this is R&D capital. So knowledge, the intangible capital sometimes include the other things. I will come back. Here the, the ULN has a something different, which is design cost share. Design cost share include not only R&D, but also uh, database, and also uh, customized uh, like a customized uh, like a network and the, this is much bigger uh, the definition and the, this is typically more like an intangible investment and uh, this design cost share is actually looking at the uh, input output table so they look at different industries and uh, some has a bigger design cost share, intangible investment, and uh, some are less. And uh, you can see again, the intangible intensive uh, sector has a lower borrowing capacity than the uh, no, in, not much intangible capital. So that's suggestive evidence, not the hard evidence of our theory. Okay, so what's the- It's also true that they're sitting on a ton of cash like Apple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They don't need to borrow. They don't need to borrow. Some of them are, uh, don't need to borrow, like Apple or Google. But uh, some of the intangible in the intensive sector, they do borrow, or they do raise funds by selling equities, too. OK, yes, uh, this, this is the debt covenant, <laughs> means the uh, maximum debt you can issue. Not necessarily they issued, actually. So, Okay, then what's the implication for the interest rate? So title says interest rate. So what happened is the, if you look at the present value of owner's share and the net of the uh, like a opportunity cost of using it, actually some of, at some point it be become negative. And uh, that means when interest rate go down, the present value of red one can go up a lot, while the black one doesn't go up much. So what is the impact of permanent decline of interest rate? This is the one macro questions. Like, uh, and uh, recently people are talking about quantitative easing. <laughs> and, uh, quantitative easing is typically try to suppress the long-term interest rate. And uh, what, suppose the interest rate drop, real interest rate, not the nominal, drop permanently, what happens? The fundraising capacity has a shorter duration than building. Building is lasting long time, while the, the funding horizon is shorter because of the, this. <laughs> so funding horizon is this one, while building horizon is that guy. So present value of F uh, is the longer duration. And then what happens is, the, OK, when interest rate drops, uh, the fundraising capacity will go up because of the, the present value of the owner's share is going up. But actually, the, the investment cost can go up more 
because of the Q has a longer duration. So there is a duration gap. So funding horizon, external funding has a shorter duration than uh, building. And as a result, when interest rate drops, the cost can go up more than the external funding, fundraising capacity. Net worth go up a little bit because of the uh, B replacement cost. This is the net worth. So net worth is this guy. So it, it can go up, uh, but the, but the, uh, the, what happened is the initially net worth may go up, but uh, eventually, the cost go up, can go up more than the fundraising capacity. And this is choking off the investment. So typically, people think low interest rate is a good news. And it's true. <laughs> like uh, low interest rate, borrowing capacity go up, and the net worth go up. But in the long run, <laughs> actually, the investment costs can go up more than uh, borrowing capacity. And then what happens is like this. The initially, the value of investment shoots up because of net worth go up. This is like a credit cycle. Like uh, the net worth go up a lot because of leverage, but, uh, and the output starts going up. And the uh, consumption also go up because of net worth is going up. And, uh, but the thing is, the, it doesn't last long because of the like uh, investment costs go up uh, more than borrowing capacity, eventually reduce the growth rate. So underlying growth rate actually drops. <laughs> and, uh, and so initially there is a eu euphoria, <laughs> but in the long run, actually it stops and uh, it enters into the low growth period. Like uh, Japan, I came from, uh, the 80s, everybody get excited. We are richer. <laughs> and, uh, we have a more net worth, and uh, we are now can buy the entire California or something ridiculous. And, uh, but then, but, uh, but uh, that is uh, net worth gains. But the truth is the investment cost, like a building cost is going up a lot, and the borrowing capacity may not catch up as much, then the underlying growth rate starts going down. And uh, when engine of growth is the plant as well as human capital, if you don't invest in plant and human capital, only excited about the value of the net worth, then eventually you run into trouble. So, so this is the something we find. And sometimes the housing market is a bit like that. So housing market, the, the net worth go up. <laughs> so people get excited. And then investment looks like going up. But uh, when you think about the newcomers, like, uh, like you, <laughs> and who don't own the house yet, <laughs> and, uh, higher housing price is a bad deal, actually, right? And uh, your borrowing capacity may not go up as much as uh, your housing price. And then the newcomer had a hard time to buy. And if newcomer don't come in <laughs> for a long time, it, economy will stagnate. So, so the, this kind of things uh, is short run, it's boosting. But in the long run, it might uh, reduce the growth rate. So this can happen in this kind of short horizon funding horizon economy, like a fundraising capacity has a long, shorter horizon than the uh, investment cost. But then you might say some of the f central bankers said, ah, but we, we reduce interest rate, usually economy stimulate. So how come that intuitions? And uh, this one is the, usually we are talking about, like now we are talking about permanent. But if you look at the temporary or medium term cycle, so suppose the interest rate go down, but not just uh, permanently, but the next five years. And after five years, it go up again, and it's sine wave. So the black line is interest rate. If you have a medium term cycles, and the funding horizon is, say, three to five years, <laughs> and actually, three to five years moves a lot. So, so while the uh, building uh, is like a 20, 30 years, <laughs> and building value doesn't go up as much for the five years 
interest rate movement. So, so in this kind of normal business cycle frequency or five-year uh, cycle, actually the, it is uh, pro-cyclical. So or the interest rate go down is a good news because the borrowing capacity reacts more than the investment cost. And then, as usual, investment go up like that. But when you do the quantitative easing and then try to manipulate the 30 year interest rate and that sort of things, interest rate drops la. Like <laughs> it's, it's not just five years, but a long time. Then it can backfire. The investment cost Q go up more than borrowing capacity. As a result, the economy can stagnate. So this is the kind of term structure of funding horizon versus investment cost. And uh, like a real, it can apply to real estate and that sort of things. OK, so that's the main things. But uh, uh, you might say, what about the, you said uh, just one parameter space. The opportunity cost is low. But uh, what happens if uh, alternative use is very good? Then turns out to be, this is like a curious things. What happens is the not every plant continues. Because a plant is valuable, alternative use is very good. So then <laughs> not every plant it started will continue. That means the, uh, the ratio tool to plant is larger than one. And the continuing plant is going to improve. While the many plant is stopping. And uh, before stopping, the productivity starts going down. So this is uh, sometimes, the initially, everybody starts with one. A bit like a graduate student, actually, sorry. <laughs> so some are going, going up, and some are quitting. And, <laughs> and uh, so, so it does start diverging, actually. So, so the, sorry to <laughs> slightly offset. <laughs> yeah, upsetting remark, but uh, it does diverge. So, so this is the sometimes Gliricus uh, called the shadow of death. Like uh, the plant before shutting down, actually pr productivity starts going down. So that and the typical I/O literature, like uh, macro I/O, like uh, Hoppenheim or that sort of things, it's uh, the productivity is exogenous. Here, the difference is productivity is endogenous outcome of maintenance. And it can diverge like that. And uh, OK, the last question I ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. Last, this is the last one, actually. <laughs> so last question is policy. So you might say, what's a policy prescription? And uh, as you hinted, actually, it's sort of constraint efficient, actually. So, so the you cannot do so easily better. Because of the key friction is the engineer cannot maintain and it's paid every period. And uh, the underlying friction is impossible to keep track the trading history of thousands of uh, engineers. So, but suppose the you cannot keep track the engineer, but the plant owner you can chase. And the plant owner, how many engineers they hire, they can find. Suppose that they can look at the wage bill of the engineer. And suppose the plant is easy to locate. And the government uh, the tax the plant owner. So, so basically, the, at the payroll tax for the engineer, key worker, at uh, Lake Tao, then what happens? So then investment of engineer is going to be actually the, and they use this the tax revenue for subsidizing investment. So, so S is the investment subsidy, and tau is the tax on the engineer's wage. And then what happens is the engineer's net worth go down, but the subsidy <laughs> is going up a lot. And it turns out to be B doesn't change in our simple uh, constant return to scale technology. As a result, the investment go up. And then what's going on? It's like a, the, the key friction is engineer cannot pre-commit to work less than competitive wage in the afterwards. And uh, they want the more funds <laughs> from owners. And uh, here, the government is uh, acting like a social creditors. So, okay, I will give you the subsidy now. 
but later you have to pay as a way of tax. And if you can do that, actually you can relax the, this uh, non-exclusivity constraint by uh, improving the fi tax finance subsidy <laughs> for investment. And uh, that will improve the welfare for everyone, actually. Can. And, uh, but the key is the government has a such kind of record. So government can chase the plant owner and more <laughs> chase how many engineer they hire. So, so without this extra power, you cannot do better. Actually, the, with a strict uh, non-exclusivity constraint, this is the constraint efficient economy. So, so the only way to do it is the plant owner, chase the plant owner and the plant owner's payment to engineer tax on that wage bill. Uh, uh, then use that tax to subsidize investment. So that's the policy. Uh, uh, you can improve, but uh, so so that's the model. Like, uh, and uh, you can see this is still the early stage of development, and uh, there are some of the curious uh, features which you can explore more. Especially like uh, productivity is endogenous, and <laughs> the it starts splitting <laughs> that sort of things. Uh, uh, we thought that's uh, charming, but uh, it's not the main focus. The uh, main focus is the, this uh, term structure of uh, investment. So investment funding capacity is shorter than the part of the investment cost. Like uh, people can own a borrow against the near-term revenue because of you keep paying to the engineers uh, every period, and the part of the engineers uh, payment is the claim to the future return. And uh, every time you give the slice, <laughs> the you don't uh, gain, get a lot. Uh, uh, the owner don't get the much return from the, uh, the distant future. The, if you, s uh, the, where is the, that result come from? It come from this, basically. So all of the model has a key assumptions <laughs> assumption is here. Basically, the owners, the strength is they own the today's productivity. But they, they need the engineer to maintain. And then in the long run, the productivity is the outcome of age, <laughs> not yours. And uh, as a result, their share, owner's share declines, engineer's share increase. And uh, that's why engineer uh, the owner don't get too much return from distant future. So, so that's the intuition we have. Yeah. So here the number of farms are in this uh, can, I, can you speak up a little? So here the number of farms are kind of fixed, right? So hmm? Number of farm is uh, actually increasing. Uh, the like uh, engineer is investing every time they have an investment opportunity, and uh, it's a uh, unit is a plant. And the number of plant is the same as the age. And uh, it does move around. And uh, we don't have a proper definition of farm, actually. So each unit is constant return. <laughs> and, and therefore, like uh, you can, sorry, uh, each unit is constant return. Te technology is basically this guy. So if you put the goods and building, you get the plant and tools, maintenance capacity. But this can be doubling up. And uh, each of them can be independent. <laughs> and then after that, each owner can maintain by hiring engineers. Yes. So, so we don't have uh, any implication for size distribution of farm or that sort of things. No? Yeah? Uh, on the actual productivity process, yeah. so do, I mean, are you yeah. Let's say, what if it's like some kind of productivity tomorrow is some kind of weighted average of like past, uh, past yeah. productivity? Yeah, that's uh, uh, embodied in Z. Yeah. No? yeah, it is persistent, but uh, Z is the uh, outcome of last period's productivity and uh, last period maintenance. So effectively, Z contains every maintenance effort from last period uh, the, in the past. This is the roundaboutness which the Ben Baberuk emphasized. So, so it's already there in this sense. 
Okay, thanks a lot. So we can still talk to us, Novo, uh, but uh, we have to move on. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Novo. And uh, so we have a 15 minute break. You can use it to ask Novo or get coffee. <laughs> and then uh, we have the final talk and thank you.